Welcome to Open Doors. Earl Benny here again with another great former Vanderbilt player straight out of Georgia. You know, Vanderbilt loved him some Georgia guys, man. They say recruit heavily in the, in the state, uh, especially the, the, the great Atlanta area. My man, Delando Crooks. How you doing, man? What's up, bro? Appreciate it. You know, they always come to that, that, that Peach State. Got to get it. Yeah, man. And a lot of people don't know is that we actually were like toes, like a like couple of years apart in terms of being student athletes together. But we ended up in master program here, learning diversity and urban studies together. Just talk about how did you know coming to Vanderbilt was the right decision for you? I think what I figured that out when I started to to look at the different networks and things available with Vanderbilt. Um, you know, growing up in Atlanta, being an immigrant from Jamaica, I had to figure out how am I going to make this thing work for me? You know, so I wanted to be an engineer. I'm about to get my PhD. Nothing in that says engineer. So um, knowing that Vanderbilt was the top school at the time and seeing the different resources that they have um, and, and everything that you could make out of it is kind of what brought me to be here and continue to to allow me to stay to get my master's and and flourish from there. So being a first gen student at Vanderbilt, what are some resources that were provided by the institution for you? Uh, that's a true question. So so at <laughs> times, you know, they they offered a lot, um, you know, but with ball, sometimes you have to to figure out where you're going to put that in, you know, where you can make time for that. So I was able to make great friends in, in the career center, um, great friends with the, the athletic director at the time, uh, late David Williams, uh, God bless his soul. That dude was literally the godfather. He connected me with folks in the graduate school. Absolutely. Um, so I was able to, to capitalize on that, being able to get myself graduate assistantships and, and learn from the graduate school that got me to where I am today. Uh, so just trying to be able to uh, make, you know, whatever work for you, if it's going to be with the Career Center, just network uh, with all the, the different alumni networks that we have at Vanderbilt um, that you're very aware of yourself. So um, that was the, the biggest driving factor for me. So coming to Vanderbilt, like people already know it's a rigorous institution. You know, when I first got here, I had to learn time management. I had to learn how to you know, really balance my schedule, understand how many hours of sleep I needed to, to, to be able to uh, go and take these tests, but also perform at a high level on the field. But one thing I was always like most proud of from an academic like standpoint was when I made the Dean's List, right? It was like, man, I, I finally did it, right? Because it's so freaking <laughs> hard. What's one of your proudest moments in that classroom at Vanderbilt? I think for me, uh, People always see, you know, just as an athlete, you know, you, you know, you just big black guy that's walking around. Um, but it became a time where folks actually started to say, oh, OK, he speaks up in class. Oh, he actually knows something, you know, or there's that kind of concept. Uh, I'm in graduate school and these folks, you know, they're onto bigger, better things as well. But they're like, oh, I remember him. He used to play football, you know, so there's these different things. Uh, where sometimes you are the only one in class or, or whatever that might look like for you. But because of that, you are standing out. You're always gonna be seen. You know, it gives you a sense of pressure, but at the same time, there's a lot of confidence and a lot of things that come with that uh, once you carry yourself. So with that, I think for me, knowing that I could be more than just an athlete at that time and, I was limitless that there was nothing else I could say about that. Uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's what I'll say. So let's unpack that a little bit because socialization for, especially some of the current students and some of the students who, you know, uh, guys like myself coming to a, a predominantly white institution, there's a, a, a culture shock coming from a low SES, you know, community myself and coming here at Vanderbilt. One thing I found hard was really finding my voice in the classroom because I didn't technically speak the language, right? How were you able to find your voice here at Vanderbilt at such an early start? 
So I think for me, I didn't find it at, at an early start. So, so that was a true question. I remember being in one class and I, I, I didn't talk as much. I think it was philosophy or something joint like that. And, and I remember I raised my hand once and the professor was like, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah, this is why I don't speak up in class. But it was because of that that made me realize I didn't speak up, which caused him to to act like that. So yeah. I had to be confident in knowing, you know, how how I talk. It, I mean, it doesn't matter of how they look at me. It's just am I comfortable within myself to say that? Uh, because they're gonna have to respect you regardless, right? You yeah. know, I didn't always have proper diction or where it mm -hmm. was too uppity to to understand things uh, like what people might perceive Vanderbilt to be uh, from the outside um, but growing those relationships with professors was was very pivotal for me so once I had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with them I could say whatever in class I don't care whatever the next person next to me had to say I didn't care how they looked at me because the professor knew who I was and what I was trying to get across uh, so that was probably the most important thing for me to socialize myself um the head coach at the time had us he primed us to be uh uncomfortable uh to yeah. sit in the front of class to to make sure you know uh speak to alumni networks uh have alumni networks come to practice so we could talk to them um we talked to be a part of different clubs um uh, if you had the time or talk to different people in your classes yeah. so that was the main thing. Uh, and I think from all of that, that's kind of what instilled in me to continue that throughout my four years. The thing that I'm teaching guys is that your perspective is vital, right? Because there are some guys who enter the classroom and they're nervous, right? I was the guy whose hands got sweaty feet. You know, you're, you're hoping that the professor don't say anything to you. But what is missed out is that if we don't share our perspective, then others that are in the classroom would never really understand like where we come from. They'll never understand what it is to be a student athlete at a predominant white institution. And so I always try to encourage guys to socialize, network, talk to others in classroom, just because you never know what's going to happen without the, you know, the, the transitions in life. And so I, I think that's, that's critical, man. You know, obviously you're pursuing a PhD. You'll be done in about a year. I'm pursuing a PhD. You'll be done in about a year. So, you know, it's great now that we are able to be expressive and talk on various subjects. And so it's it's just really good to, you know, always enlighten the guys and share knowledge with, you know, hey, in this classroom, like, like do your best, like speak up and talk, share your voice because it's important. So we, we're going to transition a little bit from academics to talk a little bit about football. Um, how do you want current student athletes to remember your career? My career at Vanderbilt. Your career, your career, man. Everybody's career is different, you know? Like, I don't want people to remember me as, like, Earl, this guy who set a lot of records. I want people to remember me as, like, yeah, man, that dude worked his butt off. He worked hard to try to do everything he could to get Vanderbilt to the next level. You know, like, that's how I want y'all to remember me. You know, like, understand that, hey, his habits, his work ethics was what really, like, separated him. Not all the accolades but the things that people didn't really see behind the scenes. Right. Um, for me, I think it, it was along the same lines. Uh, I remember at one point, you know, during, during them summer camps, it would get hard, you know, you, know, <laughs> you got people laid out in, in, the, in the locker room. I had to put a, a screensaver just to remind myself, like, remember why you started, mm. right? Um, for me, I play offensive alignment, so we, we're not getting no, no praise anyways, right? So <laughs> it, it's it's up to you to figure out, you know. I love the big guy. Playing. I love the big guy. I mean, I appreciate that, you <laughs> yeah. know, but on the grand scheme of things, you know. Yeah, for sure. The only time you're going to see us is if we get a penalty yeah. or we get hurt. <laughs> Got to lip off the field. So um, at that point, you know, guys are playing. They're like, you know, one of a pro, but for me, yeah, you know, that was at one point, you know, a, a dream of mine is to go pro. But at the end of the day, I'm like, OK, let's get this work. You know, um, we we when I was there, we were winning at one point, you know, uh, yeah. having nine one seasons, eight one seasons. Um, and then after that, when it started to change and we, we weren't as successful. 
we have to get back to that. You know what I'm saying? So at that point, we're at that point, I'm like, this is bigger than me. How are we gonna, we gonna get back to that place? Um, and that's kind of where the work came in. So there'll be times where we just had to to get together and be either initiated by myself or I would go by myself or go on my own. And then sometimes we just ended up being a whole collective group would be out there on a Saturday, you know, after guys doing seven on seven, big guys over there doing one on ones on our own. Um, so, you know, talking about being outworked or, you know, no one be out, outwork you or, or nothing like that we're going to do this together. And that's kind of me as a player. I'm, I always say I'm good in every hood. And I meant that with even everybody in the, in the locker room. And that's yeah. kind of what I always want to be remembered as in my career. So you experienced not just a little, you experienced a lot of success at Vanderbilt because you went to multiple bowl games, right? Right. What is one thing or one piece of advice that you would give to current student athletes in terms of reaching success on the field? Um, one is to, you have to put that work in like you've never done before. Um, at this point, you know, Vanderbilt is, is back at a place where people expect Vanderbilt to be typically, right? You know, mm -hmm. that no one expects Vanderbilt to be on top. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that's the biggest chip on your shoulder, but you have the biggest upside out of all of it. Um, so with that, treat it, you know, just like Baylor yesterday with, with the with the NCAA basketball. Everybody was against him because Zaga's going to have this perfect season. No one is expecting Baylor to win. Nobody's expecting Vanderbilt to win. You know, um, with COVID last year, people were like, you know, Facebook group, the SEC fa uh, Facebook group said, um, when the ESPN and the SEC decided to have all conference game and they were like, Vanderbilt was like, yikes, um, you know, so they made the meme. So again, no one is expecting Vanderbilt to win. So take that, you are part of the team for a reason, right? So take that and motivate yourself. Everyone's betting against you. What are you going to do with that? You know, motivate, use that as motivation to, to get to that next level. I'm going to prove you wrong regardless if you think or didn't think uh, I was going to be there. I'm going to be there regardless um, and go from there. So and bring your teammates with you, you know, be be the best person you could be. Uh, but no one's expecting you to do this. And that's why you're going to do it. And you're going to, you know, shock the world. Yeah, I think for a lot of people is that, you know, many are thinking that we may try and reenact, try to be a Notre Dame, try to be an old Miss, but Really, we're just trying to be the best Vanderbilt team that we can be, that we know we right. can be. And our goal is to win the SEC and to win a national championship. But all those things come with, like, work ethic. You know, it, it comes with habits. It comes with creating a different culture that, you know, not many have seen here at Vanderbilt. And all of that really just takes time and each and every day, getting better 1% each and every time. So, obviously, you're very successful. You, you've been able to, you know, do undergrad, do a master's, you're working on a PhD. What is your favorite book that you've read in the past year? In the past year, I like Stand from the Beginning, uh, bestseller yeah. from uh, Ibram Kennedy. Ibram. And, and we read it a while back, um, but that's something that's always going to stick with me. I was able to yeah. see him talk, um, you know, that we have to realize that we are expected to be a certain kind of thing, whether it be just athletes as black males. Yeah. But we could propel at that and everything that we put our mind to. Yeah. And I think that's why I appreciated that book so much. But yeah. yeah. So mine that I've read over the past year uh, is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Candy. And the entire staff has actually, you know, got the book and, and started reading it too. So it's really cool because now everybody is learning how to engage in hard conversations, right? Like one thing that a lot of organizations do is like when racial ruptures or different uh, instances occur is that they just kind of like, all right, let's not talk about it because it's difficult or, or how do we uh, uh, have, you know, the token black guy or the token black woman to just speak on it when now like we're educating our entire staff on it. So I think that's pretty cool. And, you know, we're, we're continuing to learn. Everybody is understanding uh, the 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 landscape, the political and social landscape 
a society is, is at an all time high right now. And so our job is to, you know, be diligent, to educate ourselves and, and gain as much knowledge as we can. Last thing, what's your most memorable moment in Dudley Stadium here at home? Most memorable. Give me something. Did a cartwheel. You, you, you caught a pass in the flat as a lineman. Yeah. Give me something. What you got? I ain't gonna do no cartwheel because that's probably where my career would have ended right there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what we did, I think the biggest thing was when uh, that year we beat Tennessee, Florida, um, I think Ole Miss too. Like, yeah, Dudley was off the chain. That mug was yeah. bonkers. You know, <laughs> um, you know, you had the whole student section packed out. That's awesome. Um, it was just a, a dimness, different atmosphere than what, you know, you're typically used to on every, every set, um, Saturday night. So, yeah. Uh, and th history was being made. And I think as we continue to make history, that feeling just continues to rejuvenate and, and push us forward. And that's kind yeah. of, that's my memory for sure. Yeah. So, Delando, it's been a pleasure. How can people follow you on social media and, and keep up with the great work that you're doing? For sure. Um, I'm on, it's IG, Lando.Crooks. I'm on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, you could get me on um, Snapchat at Biggest Land. Twitter, I ain't there yet. Y'all be having too much Twitter drama for me right now, but we're going to get there. <laughs> That's my man, Delando Crooks, man. I appreciate you for being on today. I appreciate you, bro.